Hello everybody, this is the DBC Community Show. My name is Michael, and I'll be your host. We'll be speaking with various members of the Dragon Ball community that make Canada such a rich hub for the sport we love. Today, I've got Wendy Zhu. She's a figure whose influence far outsizes her stature. She has been involved in our sport in a wide variety of manners, from her start in Montreal's burgeoning college and university Dragon Boat scene, to racing, steering, and drumming for one of Canada's top clubs, a true triple threat, and now a valued member of Dragon Ball Canada's board of directors. Most importantly to me, she is a dear friend, always willing to entertain my many Dragon Boat fever dreams with genuine consideration. I am so happy to have her to be our inaugural guest. So without further delay, I bring you Wendy Zhu. Let's get this started. Um, <laughs> I think the, the one question I'm going to ask everybody is how did you, uh, tell me how did you got started on this, in the sport? What do you remember about the very, very beginnings? Uh, so how I got started in the sport is I had a good friend, Andy, um, who happened to be captain of the Marinopolis Dragon Ball team, Senses of the Dragon, and in our second year of CJEP. And he persuaded me to join and in full disclosure, I had no intention of joining. Um, I was like, okay, you know, I'll come to the first practice, but I had no intention of actually staying. Um, and I went to the first practice and you were the coach. And I do remember that you were late. I'm not sure <laughs> if you were late or if you just didn't show up. Um, oh, but wow. It was rough because you were supposed to bring the paddles for it. Uh, we were holding this practice in an indoor pool on the Marinopolis campus. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I, I know what practices you're talking about. Okay. Um, and I was supposed to bring the paddles and I didn't? Exactly. Well, no, I think you brought the paddles, but you didn't bring yourself. <laughs> I, like, I, 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 I know exactly the pool that you're talking about I, I totally forgot that we used to do that but um but i do not remember this incident with the uh, with the pool paddles i i've got to be completely honest um so i apologize for that but um clearly i i or the environment did something right because you're still here um, i mean it was fun it was fun i still enjoyed it whether it was the first practice or the second practice because the first one didn't happen Okay, um, one question that I don't think I've actually ever asked you in the what, close to 12, 13 years that we've known each other, um, were you somebody that was, like, would, would you call yourself athletic before starting Dragon Boat? Absolutely not. And that is why I had no intention of staying in the sport and actually joining the team. I was super unathletic, like this chubby, lazy kid that hated sports, did not enjoy gym class, did no physical activity whatsoever. Um, so no, I was not athletic, I was not into sports, and that is the biggest impact I think that Dragon Ball has had on me, to turn me into a slightly more athletic person. Slightly, slightly. We'll, we'll stay humble there. And, um, okay. Uh, I want to go straight to something a little bit more uh, relevant to the present, but still staying in the past. You, uh, you later on will help to uh, create, uh, as far as I know of, the first real serious McGill Dragon Ball team. Um, and uh, do you have, what do you remember from the days of building a club from scratch? Uh, so building a club from scratch is really tough. It's a combination of luck and begging your friends to help you out. Um, I really enjoyed my first year of Dragon Ball. Like it had such an impression when it was so fun and what, like a great experience that I really wanted to continue that. And since I had graduated from Marinopolis, I couldn't stay on that team. And McGill didn't have a team for me to join. So I'm someone that, you know, likes to do things. If, if it's not there, I'll do it myself. And so I was like, well, if there's no team there, let's make a team. Um, and since there wasn't that existing infrastructure, the biggest thing is 
figuring out what needed to be done and getting people to join. And especially that first year, um, it cons the team consisted of almost entirely of our friends, right? Like Andy and I and uh, Chris and Nina were like the, the four people that yeah, built that yeah. team. And it largely consisted of our friends um, with like, I think one random person that just happened to find out about it at McGill and, and joined, um, but everybody else was someone we had known and that we persuaded or coerced or bribed or threatened to join. Yes, I, I, when I think back to those first years of, uh, of uh, Dragon Boat Sea, as it was called back then, uh, that like 90% of them were like within one step of being like a close high school friend or something like that. Like people exactly. that you've known for a long time. Um, so going along with this idea of like, okay, so before Dragon Boat, you were not a, 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 a sporty kind of person. Uh, before Dragon Boat, were you at, or uh, like, were you an organization kind of person, the type of person that likes to build, that, that likes to participate in school clubs or any stuff, anything like that? Or was well, Dragon Boat also the beginning? Okay. No, no. So I, I'm, I'm big on like doing everything possible. So okay. at Marinopolis, for example, they had a lot of clubs and I think I joined like 10 of them. Um, a bunch of them were, were obviously like the really nerdy clubs. Like I was president of the math club and the chemistry club. Mm. You know, I joined the medical science club. Um, but basically I like to sign up for every opportunity I can because I don't like saying no and if it seems interesting to me I want to give it a try so I do like trying things out so um, that combined with the fact that if I think I can do something well then I want to be able to do it that's kind of goes along with the like managing or organizing thing side of things um, so like I mentioned, I was like head of the math club and the chem club. So I definitely had some organizational experience already, but not to the same extent as like managing an entire Dragon Boat team. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I don't think you, you, you had any uh, foresight for the, 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 the caliber of organization you were going to get yourself uh, involved in over the, over the next years. Um, I found one memory from back then, and I want to... Um, I want you to comment on it, see what you remember about that. So I, I shared the screen. Do you see that? I see that. But do you remember this? I remember that. That was at um, Mo the Montreal Festival, Midbrith. So uh, so in case people are listening to this uh, in the format of the podcast, and so you have no idea what we're talking about, I just shared a old picture that we found um, where uh, at the Montreal Olympic Basin at a competition. This must date back to 2009. Uh, no, uh, this must be like 2007 or 8. Um, and the McGill team has a better 200 meter time than the Harvard team. And so obviously, uh, McGill, Harvard, anytime we get to post, uh, we will take advantage of it. <laughs> but uh, uh, the times are really nothing spectacular is <laughs> uh, 200, 258 seconds uh, harvard has a 259 seconds like m almost every school team these days is able to to do better than that i mean it's all relative right we oh yeah not a competitive team and you said 2007 to 2008 it was, it was definitely later than that i only started university in 2008 <laughs> okay so it must it must have been 2008 or 2009 no, I think 2010 or 11, maybe. Really? Oh, you're, you might be right. You might be right. Yeah, that's true, because uh, because actually this will be a good segue, because uh, uh, you were still on the McGill team in 2011, because that McGill team will become True Grit in 2012. Correct. So uh, perfect segue into my next question. So 2012, we've created True Grit with the purpose of going to uh, Club Cruise uh, in Hong Kong. This is going to be uh, your first involvement in any kind of international dragon boat racing. Uh, you have already told me in personal communications that this was uh, by far the most stressful period that you have ever lived. Um, yeah, I have one single white hair, and I'm convinced it's from 2012. Um, and uh, 
and it's some of the things that come back to my mind when I think of 2012 and, and you and I in Hong Kong. One is um, you being thrown into the fire uh, as a steer, because in Hong Kong, how like I didn't you hadn't steered that much before we we had to do it in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong was very very rough conditions. Hong Kong was very rough, even for experienced steers, and some steers did really great. Um, I did not do really great. Uh, that was my first ever season steering, and I had only had like a few practices before that, so I was I was definitely not experienced. And Hong Kong was not just my first world experience steering; it was my first competition steering. I had never steered a race before that. Um, I only steered uh, one distance because we only put in a women's team into one distance, which I think was the small boat 200. And uh, mm -hmm. we only ended up having two races for that because the third had been cut off due to uh, scheduling constrictions. And so out of those mm -hmm. two races, the first one was a DNF because I finished outside of the, out of my lane which was in lane one, so it was outside of the view of the camera, the recording camera. And the second race was a DQ because I crashed. So for that period of time, I had a 0% success rate in steering. Okay, to, to be fair, you're only counting the, uh, the, the second, like the overall result, because I do remember that the first race, we would have two races in 200s and two races in 500s and your first race of each we didn't race. do the 500s uh, we only entered a team into the 200 we only enter a team to the 200s okay darn yeah so i only had those two races <laughs> for that season and neither of them was successful i like looking back at what i put you through i have to start off by apologizing for not better preparing you for <laughs> <laughs> for what what was to come um and uh, but at the same time a uh, testament to your resiliency because i would i could easily imagine people giving up after something after being put through something like that um, i needed to make it up <laughs> that could be my legacy you know um and I guess this will lead well to the question I had prepared for the 2012 period. Um, how did Hong Kong Club crews change your perspective on the sport? And, like, because up to this point, you've only really experienced the sport as a fun activity to, to, to do with your friends. You had started ever so slightly getting competitive at the, through the 2011 season, and then we decided to take that big bump into 2012. So what do you remember about that? Yeah, I definitely at the beginning, my initial goal was just to have fun and enjoy it because I did have fun uh, on the Marinopolis team. For Hong Kong, that was the first experience I had to seeing the team that we had grown and built together um, be actually competitive and successful at not just like a small local regatta, but on the international stage. To me, that was such an amazing thing to have accomplished. And that was done together, right? Like, especially because mm -hmm. it grew as a group of friends to be able to have worked together with these people that you love and like and, and enjoying being with, but that you worked together to accomplish this goal. It was like, oh, we're actually able to do this, right? Against all these other amazing, super competitive, high level teams that have these longer histories of competing. And we're just like this ragtag um, new team that like didn't really know what we were doing. Let's just try it out and see how it goes. And oh, we actually like were able to do something. That to me was a really great experience and validation that we had done something really good. That's great. That's great. Uh, one, one last thing that I uh, picked out from 2012 is, as far as I can tell, this is the first time that you start also drumming at a semi-serious level. Um, and if I recall correctly, it's in Hong Kong that, and the announcers will make a comment about how you seem to drum like, like a really professionally or something like that. And I am convinced, um, here, let's uh, share the screen. 
Okay, this is a video. This is a picture from from Thailand, but uh, but, uh, but for those who are watching, this is a, this the distinctive Wendy style of drumming, um, and I am convinced that every single person who drums like this uh, in Canada that is not you is in one way or another influenced by you, and they don't realize it. Uh, I definitely did developed my own style of drumming, not on purpose. Um, that that was the year that I started drumming, I guess, more seriously. And it was the first time we actually had to do the drumming motion. So I was just trying it out. And I had tried this out, I think, the first time at the Ottawa Festival um, before Hong mm -hmm. Kong, because we were just trying to test it out and see how, how drumming would actually be. And I remember that it was just either getting in my way. I remember thinking, okay, there's all these like rules. You have to have it like above your head. You have to have it visible and all these things. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I do this? And honestly, going up and down was really tiring and it just didn't seem like a very efficient motion. And I wanted to go along with both like the motion of the boat and also like the paddling motion. Like, how could I get this to be in sync with people and have it be natural? And it just eventually progress to like this like sideways diagonal motion um that felt natural to me um and i guess maybe looked cool that's always an upside <laughs> and then uh, people started like, commenting on it so i was like well you know this is my thing now like nobody this is 100 percent natural evolution you, you nobody nudged you taught you no, this is definitely uh, in, in my kind of developed way. style. <laughs> uh, because, because for real, like I, I think back to was it the 2019 Regina Nationals, and I'm I'm certain I've seen a handful more people drum this way, um, and and just a few years prior, there'd be exactly one person doing this and be so. I, I so so I'm happy to have gone back through the pictures and seen that like I'm pretty sure it's, it starts that year in 2012. Well I'm happy to have started a trend. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now uh, now let's move forward a little bit more. Um, in 2013, I, I don't want to be mean and, and skip through this uh, because I mean it's still pretty important. In 2013 you'll go uh, to your uh, you'll participate in your first world championships in, in Hungary. Um, but I actually want to go to something that I find more interesting. 2014, 2014, you're going to change clubs. You move from Montreal to Toronto to start your PhD. You go from 22 Dragons to NDRC. Um, do you, what do you remember as, uh, were there any growing pains in uh, transitioning from one uh, club culture to another? Definitely. Um, I had a lot of homesickness for my Dragon Boat Club back in Montreal. Like, I still consider 22 Dragons as my original home club. And any chance I get, if they have a group photo, I always sneak in there. Um, and the cultures were pretty different. Um, as an example, I feel like in 22 Dragons, it was more of a focus on technique and in NDRC there was more of a focus on fitness and again that's not to say that either one doesn't have the other focus but that's what I personally felt to be more of like the defining features of the team and I complain all the time that I had the bad luck of all the team out of all the teams I could have joined in Toronto I joined New Dragons Running Club because yeah for um, those who don't know Wendy Wendy does not like running <laughs> running um I said I, I didn't used to be an athletic person and I definitely didn't used to be a running person and I am still not a running person um but so so that was like a big difference in how the teams were were structured just in terms of training um it NDRC was a group of friends so that was kind of like a nice culture uh, to transition to because that was what I was used to before though obviously they weren't my original friends so I made new friends but um, they do have a very family culture which I love and that's the best thing that I like about NDRC and that's also what I had come from um, 
with uh, 22 Dragons and True Grit because that was the group of friends that we had built together. So, so that was, I think, one of the luckiest things that I was able to transition to, to a team in Toronto. Very well said, very well said. And I mean, it'll, uh, you, it pays off because 2014, you guys go to Italy, you guys came back with another medal, if I remember correctly, that's right. Yeah, we came back with one bronze, um, which would have originally seemed like a disappointment because NDRC came back from Hong Kong with a ton of medals, including uh, one or two golds. Um, but Italy was really tough competition and not to say Hong Kong wasn't, but Italy was was uh, really tough, really strong teams. It was a bit of a struggle for our team and we had had such um, difficulty throughout the entire competition um, coming in like fourth or fifth or even not, be, not even making the A division um, and especially coming off of Hong Kong, people's expectations really had to be adjusted that basically almost our last possible chance of a medal, the mixed 500, we eked out a bronze and that is, I think, one of the medals I'm most proud of because it was such a hard race, but a very well executed race. Like it wasn't just we happened to get a good result, like the race itself was was perfectly executed like everyone did their job we we ex we had a plan and we went with it the calls were great the control was great the the speed was great just like everything really worked well together and it paid off with that result and i remember yeah, we so to, have, to, to have that pay off after, after exactly like paying off at, at the at the end of a of a hard weekend uh, of of feeling like you had to adjust to, to accept possibly the idea that like that we might leave without a medal and sit to cap it off with exactly exactly and I think we were only like 0. 0.0 something seconds ahead of fourth place so it was so close wow wow I I did not know that part about the about the Rep and the story so that is that is really really awesome um. But you're not going to stop there. Um, let's go to 2015. Uh, that's World Championships in Welland. Uh, you're going to drum with the Premier Team, but you're also going to help me out with uh, the Junior National Team, um, which is going to be uh, interesting because neither you or I had any experience coaching anybody under the age of 18 up until that point. We, uh, you or I, you and I, had really cut our teeth as you two four involved patterns and coaches. Um, what do you remember about having to coach children? Um, I remember having to warn you about language a lot. <laughs> um, and I think kind of similarly to Hong Kong, uh, so much of it was just learning by trial by fire and figuring things out as we went along and trying to do as much ahead of time to figure out what needed to be done so that things at the actual time would go relatively smoothly. So figuring out the cha the chaperones ahead of time, figuring out um, like the accommodations, the meals, how the kids would work out, um, that kind of goes with, with just the management aspect of planning. Like I firmly believe that if you plan things well enough, it'll work out, even if you've never done it before. Um, and I'd like to think that it worked out pretty well. Uh, the team was very successful. And uh, I think overall the juniors had a very good time and a positive experience. The uh, one thing that I did not do great on was the ice breaking activities where I did suggest the, the, that you could not have <laughs> you could not have planned it was, a, it was a lapse in judgment um I didn't choose the best and safest activity which involved running around the parking lot and that the cars were not the issue it was the fact yeah. that one of the kids slipped and fell on the ground and severely skinned his arm and required uh a lot of first aid to, to, to fix that up and patch him up. Um, and I'm very sorry, Will, to this day that that <laughs> happened. It, it is brought up every time we see each other. Yeah, 
but I'm, but I mean, um, funnily enough, um, un unfortunately for Will, uh, but I, I almost think that that event, um, and specifically Will uh, getting just injured enough that it was serious, but not so much that we, that, that like, that it hampered his ability to paddle, like, that, that event sort of bonded the team ever so slightly more. As, as, sad, as, as bizarre as that might sound, I, I do actually get that impression. Not, by no means am I suggesting that we should put children in harm's way for the sake of, of, for the sake of creating these bonding moments. But looking at it- Bond over tragedies. Yeah, yes. Uh, that can be said about many U24 national teams. That's true, that's very true. <laughs> um, we're gonna, uh, let's move on to 2016. So I wanna start off with, um, I'm gonna start off with World Cup. Uh, and I'll start that off by sharing the last picture that I have saved, which is this one. Uh, let's zoom this in. Um, what do you remember about feeling like a celebrity in China? Um, it was really cool. Like World Cup is one of my favorite um, dragon boat experiences because it's so different and so unique. And there's so many, so much packed into such a short amount of time, but so much like really cool and interesting stuff. Um, I had less of a celebrity kind of experience, especially in 2016, because I would say um, the non-Asians of the team had more of a novel factor for for the locals, right? Like we, if we're Asian, we just blend it in with everybody else. Um, right. But that being said, still being like like one of the athletes as part of the team and having you know people look at you and um, uh, like people wanted to take pictures that. Uh, a store could have been decathlon i'm not sure um i think so yeah from what, from what i can tell i remember random great. strangers would like ask me as to like add me on wechat and <laughs> i i don't live in china i don't know how common this is to ask a random stranger that but if it's the equivalent of asking a random stranger on the street here to add you on facebook like it's pretty uncommon so that was interesting and cool um, I don't think I actually added people, but uh, you, you are not the type to do that. That's for sure. But it was a, it was a very cool experience. It was it was really fun. Um, and the, the, for those people, for the people who don't know about the World Cup format, like there are plenty of different. Uh, unique uh, race formats right like uh, the 100 meters raced there's the uh, there's the relay 200 where you have the two uh, you have your boat split into uh, two small boats of men and women and they race towards each other um, and you have the, the the you have the 1k 1k 2k 1k the 1k where where the where the uh, where you have to have the this fast, the, the men's boat try to catch up to the women's boat and pull them along uh, uh, on the wash to try to get the best time that you that you can. And I, I my thought, uh, I know that we've already spoken about this on a personal basis, but um, what do you do? You think there's anything that we can pull from the World Cup style of racing that we could try out in local competitions? Definitely. So um, I think one of the, I mean, the, one of the main reasons that the World Cup is structured like it is, is because it is broadcast on television. And so a lot of it has to do with the entertainment factor, right? Making these races uh, fun, interesting and entertaining for the general public. And mm -hmm. if we did some of that and kind of made Dragon Boat look more interesting to the general public, I think that could get more people interested in Dragon Boat. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time, have it be really fun for the participants, because as a racer, this was incredibly cool to do. Um, two particular races are the ones you mentioned. So the 200 meter relay and the 1K pursuit. Uh, in particular, I think the 200 meter relay is a really fun race to both participate in and to watch because you do see um, the teams going, the women's team racing across in one direction on the outside of the course and the men's teams are on the inside. So 
the men's teams, as soon as the women's team crosses the finish line, an official drops a flag. And that's kind of like the go signal for the okay. men's team to go. And uh, part of the difficulty with this is actually the wash. The wash. Because yeah, the I was going to say that. The men have to from, deal with it. Yeah, the men have to deal with that. And if you're in any kind of rough water or you have a heavy boat or you have a tippy boat, which we did have, um, you got to be really careful about that. Uh, and and uh, sinking is probably actually a very real concern. <laughs> so, so probably like I'm thinking a lot of race organizers would be leery at having to deal with flipping boats. There and are, there are boats, safety but, issues involved. <laughs> But but I completely agree that if we can if we can add these different kind of formats and and and, and treat them seriously and not just as these one offs uh, that are like sort of like like I feel like for example the 100 meter race the few the very few cases I know that do it really just treat it as a gimmick as a throw as a throwaway kind of a, hey why not let's do this uh, but I do think that if we if we treat these 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 novel formats with uh, with seriousness then people will take it just as seriously and really put yeah, their I agree. I agree. Into so it. I mean it could start out as like a an exhibition style or even as a race that that matters but like as a like a show race uh, to get, kind of get people first involved and interested and once you treat it seriously people will also treat it seriously right um but the mm -hmm. It'll, if you treat it just like any other race, right? Like different competitions have several race formats. You can have a 200 meter uh, knockout at the same time as a 2K and at the same time as like a regular 500 straight away. Um, and you just treat all of these races as equal in terms of priority and importance. Um, and then you can just treat this race the same way. But um, if you have that entertainment factor, right? It adds a little extra interest to it, especially for, for audiences that like don't normally watch Dragon Boat or aren't that involved with the community. So they are just like tuning in and being like, oh, this looks kind of cool, rather than just regular, normal straightaway races, which for a typical bystander are maybe a little bit less interesting to watch. Completely agree on, with you on that one. Um, Think, uh, so when I think back to 2016, so I mentioned the World Cup, uh, but another interesting thing about 2016 is, that, and correct me if I'm wrong on the dates, but I believe that this is also the year that you become head coach of Iron Dragons, that's correct? That's correct. And um, with success, as far as I know of, the 2016 uh, Iron Dragons was the top team and you guys won national championships, if I remember well, right? Yeah. Had won nationals, um, specifically in the university category. Um, uh, we won the university banner, and we also won the gold team medals for university U2 4 mix. And um, we didn't enter gender teams that year for U2 4, mm. uh, but we did have a premier open team entered. Yes, that's right. That's right. I remember you guys, uh, the, the, the open team had decided to race in Premier and, uh, and they did pretty well too. <laughs> and I believe they had gotten a bronze. Yes. Open division. So I, that was had, a, a great success. Um, Iron Dragons, what, what team did they, did they beat that year? Was that the, the year that the Iron Dragons uh, went, uh, was, went faster than NDRC on one of the races? That was, that was, I think it was the 200 meter final um, where it was uh, Hounds, Outer Harbor Hounds in first and then Iron Dragons in second and NDRC Open in third. And, and the internet loved trolling NDRC about that for at least a, at least a good year, two years about that. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, so I, I want to I want to go over two things about you and coaching and head coaching Iron Dragons. Um, as far as I know of, as far as I know of, but somebody might correct me, but you might have been the first um, female head coach of a university team as far as I'm aware of. Um, how did you end up in that position? Did you feel, did, did at any point the fact that you were a woman, did you feel that uh, that 
make that a, an additional challenge? Um, I had never actually thought about that before. So, so you bringing that up just now, I was like, oh, is that true? I don't know. Um, Cause I, it had never occurred to me before for that. Um, mm -hmm. I would say being a female coach in that regard didn't have any um, impact in the sense that it's not something I had considered or, or had thought mm -hmm. about. Um, that being said, um, being a female in, let's say leadership positions in drag boat. Like I have kind of been aware of that in some, in some cases um, where I know that there are fewer female coaches slash um, uh, maybe captains in, in a lot of teams. Um, so that was, I guess, like a little bit of a different aspect. I think you are right that I was the first head co female coach for Iron Dragons at least. Mm -hmm. um, Though I do need to mention that I was a co-head coach with uh, Andre, so we, we were two head coaches that year. Okay. Um, but especially since Iron Dragons is an engineering team specifically, mm -hmm. um, in engineering being a program that is typically more male dominated, um, I think we had a lot of strong female characters. Um, okay on that team just by virtue of being female engineers. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like we've, we've had a captain, uh, Marissa, who was captain when I first joined Iron Dragons as a coach, mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a female lead. And uh, she's a strong personality. She's a great uh, female leader. And I think having the fact that they are already um, going against the norm by just being female engineers helped a lot with female leadership positions on Iron Dragons. And so that had never felt to me awkward or weirdly standing out uh, mm -hmm. being a female coach because as a team that they had that culture of having strong female leads. That is uh, really, that, that is a very good point. It's something that I forgot to consider, but yes, like I, I know that uh, the uh, AS team here in Montreal um, also a bunch of engineers and also has a um, has a tenant it's been it's already been noticed that the women that come out of that uh, school uh, of that dragon boat team tend to be the more headstrong types and and i completely agree that there's there's probably a, a thing about how you're already a woman in the world of engineering so you've already sort of learned to develop a little bit of that uh, of that personality uh, to, to help stand out amongst the, the swaths of, of men that you're surrounded with. Um, the last thing that I remember about you as a head coach in 2016 is uh, the idea of no fun. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm apparently kind of famous for that. Um, and that started out with uh, sun, okay? Because I know that being out in the sun makes people tired, even if they don't realize this. And I actually got this from Matt Smith. Um, I remember in, in Victoria Nationals, he would tell um, the women's team, you know, don't stay out in the sun. It might feel good, especially if you're wet and cold and it helps to warm you up. But in the long run, it'll make you tired. Um, and I like really remember that uh, strongly. And, and I agree with that. Like being out in the sun for a long time makes you tired. It feels good at the beginning, but competitions are all day affairs. They last a long time and you need your energy. Um, and like you know, sunburns, just like walking around, using a lot of energy, things like that. So I would tell the team, stay out of the sun. And I had made it into like a little catchphrase, you know, uh, no fun in the sun. And then it became no fun. <laughs> Um, and that's not to say I don't encourage fun because I do encourage fun and I tell my team, you know, you can walk around, you can talk to your friends and think, just stay out of the sun, you know, bring a hat, bring an umbrella, stay in the shade, but it ended up being no fun and then people kind of just like went with that. I, I also, as a follow up to that, I, I remember at some point you, uh, like, uh, again, you and I were joking about this and you, and, uh, and you said something along the lines of like, during a competition, uh, like no fun and no fun in the sun, because anyways, winning is fun. And so you can't win if you're tired. So uh, so it's not really no fun. It's just that like we choose where to have fun. Winning is fun, so. Yeah, and, and I, I need to clarify that when I say winning is fun, I don't mean, you know, 
winning is the only source of fun. And sometimes winning also may not be fun if you do it in a not great way, right? If you um, take things too seriously, I don't believe in taking things too seriously. Um, I have said that before though, right? Where I, I, I'm not gonna take those words back, um, but to put it in context, um, yes. racing is still serious. Um, and I wanted people to be in the right mindsets. So um, definitely have fun when you're able to, but when it's time to be serious, be serious. Um, and I okay. will say that the team completely was able to do that. Um, like they were definitely able to get into the right mindset. Like I never had uh, big problems with them for that, but it's just good to remind people, right? Like sometimes um, there's the right time for fun and then there's the right time to be serious. And um, if your goal right now is to win a race, that's what your focus should be on. And that's what your mind should be on, on that race. And so I would try to kind of like emphasize the fact, okay, your goal is to do well in this race. Your goal is to win this race. So if your goal is to have fun, your winning should be fun. Okay. You'll have fun when you win, but you won't have fun if you lose because you were gallivanting around in the sun, not thinking about things, not taking things seriously. So the right time is what you should be thinking about. Entirely agree. But I know that uh, I know that you and I uh, have a full understanding of the, the nuances around such kind of statements. But I, do, I have to admit, I do get the impression that you are uh, a little bit more memeable for some reason or another. And so these, these kind of statements tend to stick to you. I do like to, to reiterate many times, and sometimes people don't believe me, but I'm very approachable, I swear. <laughs> um, we're coming towards the end. Uh, now we're uh, from 2016, we move on to 2017. And th at this point, as far as I can recall, you start participating less and less with NDRC as a partner, uh, but you continue being uh, very involved and possibly even in getting more involved as a coach, as an administrator. Um, I believe it's around this year that you'll also join the uh, Dragon Ball Canada Board of Directors. Um, later on, we'll add to that the Dragon Ball Canada subcommittee, uh, the Youth Council. Council. Um, and for those who don't know you on a personal basis, you, you also uh, get more and more in, interested in um, less in doing uh, pure research work for your PhD, but more interested in science uh, policy and, uh, and communication. So uh, what I want to get to is, um, I wonder, is it a coincidence that um, your, your paths both from like as, a, as an athlete and in your uh, personal professional life that they start, they seem to mirror each other as you move away from the applied and more into the, um, the, the admin stuff, the, the coordination stuff and all that. Uh, that's actually really interesting. I had never thought about it that way. And those things did kind of happen around the same time. I think it was more around 2018. Um, yeah but they did happen around the same time. I don't know if that was a coincidence or if they were related, but I definitely was thinking around that time, kind of like what my goals were, like in terms of like bigger life picture, but also what I enjoyed doing and what made me happy. And uh, I enjoyed paddling. I, I really liked the sport itself. Um, I really liked the team aspect, mm -hmm. but um, one thing that applies to both Dragon Boat and my personal slash professional life is I like pe seeing people happy. Um, as uh, for running a Dragon Boat team, um, now kind of my priority is to ensure the success of the team. Whereas before I was thinking more, how can I be a stronger and better, better paddler? Um, as an individual, and I was thinking, you know, how can I make the team better? How can I run it better? How can I coach to make the team stronger and faster in my per uh, personal professional life? Um, instead of thinking, how can I do good research for this one specific project turned into how can I work on something that can benefit as many people as possible? How can I have an impact on society? So basically, how can I have a positive 
um, impact on people other than myself, on like the broader community. And that's, those are kind of two things, I guess, that worked in both Dragon Boat and my professional life. Um, side note, just uh, that just came to my mind. Uh, do you think that uh, the international uh, international program back in high school had any influence on turning you into this kind of person? Is it really bad if I say no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you do you still remember the the five um, the, the five in elements interaction? <laughs> like really not at all. I don't know. Maybe environment was one or something. Yeah, um, I, I remember going through this with Nick. Uh, this I'm probably going to edit out of the, of the YouTube video. Um, but uh, uh, what is it? Um, environment, uh, community service, um, homo faber. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't even um, know what that means. <laughs> um, the creative man. And um, in French, we called it apprendre à apprendre. There was uh there was that learn to learn yeah learning to learn yeah meta learning like learning learning the right strategies yeah when, when you mention them i'm like okay i recognize i recognize these terms and i always forget the fifth one i mean i didn't remember any of them so <laughs> i could jump up um and so to to finish this all off at this point like we've done a pretty solid recap of of all the various ways that you've been involved in Dragon Boat. So to finish this off, I'm gonna actually uh, zoom out a little bit. Um, and so I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of uh, your ongoing, like it's been over a few years that you've been involved in a D&D group. Um, you uh, regularly participate in uh, some uh, fiction writing. Uh, you have completed RCM 10 uh, for your piano? Nine. Nine. Ah, crud. <laughs> and so um, I guess I could ask you questions about uh, your, uh, your misandrous D&D uh, &D character, or um, I could ask you, why does a god wear a golden fedora? But I'm going to keep it a little bit more global, and I'm going to ask you, simply what role do you think um, your creative side uh, the, the, your creative side have in your life does it act as an escape does it act as a as a way of uh, balancing out all the time that you spend like planning out everything in your life um it's really a hobby it's just something i enjoy doing um as much as possible, I, I want to be able to enjoy the things that I do. So having an escape isn't really applicable for me because that would imply that I'm doing something I don't enjoy that I need to escape from. But I, I generally do enjoy all the things that I do, whether it be work or Dragon Boat or anything else. And um, I've always liked to be creative. So I've drawn and done a lot of artistic things since I was a kid. Um, I like dance, I like music, I like acting, I like writing. Um, and these have all, these, a lot of these have been activities I've done since I was really young that I've kind of just continued doing. And um, I think I mentioned this before where I don't like saying no to things and I don't like letting things go. So if there's something that I like doing or something that I found or that I've signed up to do, I will stick with that forever. I signed up for Dragon Boat and I've, I've stuck with that. You know, I signed up for school, stuck with that. Um, so <laughs> anything that I sign up to do, I, I just kind of like stay with that forever. And, and maybe this is a problem that I have to deal with, you know? But, but things that I sign up for, I generally sign up for because I like and I join them. And I never want to be in a position where I don't have time to do something that I enjoy. So I do my best to make time for all the things that I want to do. And I firmly believe that if you're organized enough, you can do everything. So far, it's been okay. So, so far, you've, you've uh, found a way of including all of these elements in your life. Um, I've seen you, I've seen you struggle, uh, or, or at least like find very creative and border, uh, borderline uh, dangerous manners of keeping it, of doing a lot of things in very few hours. Um, 
but that's what makes you you. That's what makes you special, Wendy. And uh, so, Wendy, I need to thank you for uh, giving me all this time and answering all of my questions. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I hope to continue uh, staying involved in all the Dragon Ball stuff uh, together because uh, we've we've done quite a few things, and I'm sure that we still have plenty more ahead of us. Thanks so much for having me and for hosting this discussion. Um, I think a, a lot of things you mentioned were things I hadn't even thought of before, so that was pretty interesting. And it's nice to be able to reflect on a lot of things. Uh, you've definitely done your research and you know some things that even I didn't know, so, so that was great. And uh, thanks again. <laughs>